some push them up, and some stick them out. held in the Humboldt County Historical Society. Documents, photographs, artifacts, uh, just a, a wonderful resource and treasure uh, preserving and uh, helping in the study and interpretation of Humboldt County history. And obviously all of that's going to be at very huge risk if uh, there's water pouring in through the roof, which is not happening currently, but that's what we want to make sure does not happen. And uh, the roof project is scheduled for later this summer. Uh, the roofing work is going to happen in August, so we're trying to do our best to make sure that there is the money to pay for that. So I uh, definitely want to thank you all so much for being here and uh, contributing to that extremely worthy cause. Now, as you're all aware, I hope, uh, part of uh, what we're doing tonight is paying tribute to Margaret Muzzy Paul, a um, great and uh, wonderful and very warmly remembered uh, character from uh, Old Town's history. And you've been seeing uh, some glimpses of her up there earlier on the slideshow. And I hope everybody's got a sort of uh, newspaper-like uh, handout uh, that tells you something about her life. And uh, please do uh, read about all of that, read about her, and get a bit more of an idea of who she was. Because it seems like uh, she was definitely a person we would all have liked to know. And of course, some of us did know her and uh, are going to share more of memories of her uh, later tonight. I unfortunately did not know her, but uh, I wanted to share a little bit about uh, her life's uh, story, her background, just so you've got kind of a framework to work with. She was born in 1901 in Wellsville, Kansas. Uh, she was one of nine siblings, and their dad was a veterinarian. Their mom was uh, the daughter of immigrants from Germany. Uh, she married, uh, I think at age 21, uh, to a gentleman named Harry, uh, Harry Abbott, and uh, they had one son, Jack, born in 1925. One thing or another, life happened, and uh, uh, Muzzy and uh, Harry ended up uh, divorced. And in 1938, uh, Muzzy was out here in Eureka. She married in 1940 to a gentleman named Joy Paul, who was a printer, a linotype operator for uh, the newspapers and uh, uh, later some of the printing companies around town. 
and uh, the two of them branched out into other lines of work. And I've got some information here from uh, one of her obituaries. It mentioned uh, that uh, in 1941, uh, Joy and Muzzy opened the Old Hamburger Inn and later purchased the Monte Carlo Hotel, which they operated for several years. They also operated the, operated the Glow Room, at which she was well known for her singing. And that's something that everyone has been uh, talking about, how well they remember her, her singing, just the, the wonderful, wonderful sound of it. Uh, I worked out at the Depot Museum in Fortuna, and a gentleman who came in there uh, just today uh, mentioned to me that he remembered as a kid standing outside on the sidewalk outside the Monte Carlo Hotel and listening to her singing. There's uh, another uh, article that came out around the time of her death in 1971, and uh, a descri description they used, uh, it says, The silver-haired contralto was one of the last true performers of the old times blues as well as the modern popular song, with a specialty of many Yukon ballads she learned during a year in Alaska where she performed for nightclubs and for servicemen at Anchorage Air Force Base. Her repertoire included more than 200 songs. She was also noted for a keen wit and sense of humor, which included kidding herself as well as her clientele. Muzzy often stated that she had no customers at her glow room, just friends, she said, all of them. And in that spirit, uh, we're all friends here tonight, and I believe it is just about time uh, for us friends to join in uh, this wonderful dinner that's been pre prepared for us. Uh, we've got a table of some special guests uh, over here, uh, this round table there. I think they can uh, start and be the first ones uh, over at uh, the buffet line there. From the slide up there, I've been asked to give a presentation on wild times in Old Town. Of course, uh, one could say that all times in Old Town have been wild, but I can't talk about everything that's ever happened here. So tonight I'm going to touch on some historical trends and some entertaining anecdotes from life in this part of town, from Eureka's earliest days all the way on up into the 1930s. Now, as Euro-American settlers streamed into Humboldt County in the 1850s, Eureka quickly developed as a major shipping point a major industrial center, a major population center, and as the biggest pleasure district on the North Coast. In the earliest days, of course, the city of Eureka and what we now call Old Town were one and the same. As the town expanded inland from the bay, the pleasure-based businesses such as saloons, brothels, and gambling dens were increasingly segregated into the streets nearest the waterfront. The boundaries of Eureka's lower level, tenderloin or red light district changed over time, but in more recent memory, this scandalous region of town came to be known by the general description North of Fourth. In 1866, just about 15 years after the town was founded, there were five saloons in Eureka. That modest number grew to 21 saloons in 1875 and 40 saloons in 1895. In 1909, it's estimated that Eureka boasted or was afflicted by a whopping 65 saloons and 32 brothels. Now, during... <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you. During the Prohibition era, of course, uh, in the 1920s and early 1930s, there were officially no saloons in town, but uh, the number of brothels seems to have remained fairly constant. Eureka had an estimated 35 brothels in operation in the early 1930s, employing around 250 women. So, our images start with a newspaper ad that was printed in July 1860. I find it interesting to note that only 10 years after Eureka was founded, the Pioneer Billiard Saloon is being referred to as an old and well-established saloon. We also see here an ad for Brett's Saloon, which according to historical rumor was the favorite hangout of the hard-drinking Ulysses S. Grant during his service at Fort Humble in the 1850s. Both of these early Eureka saloons were located on Front Street, near the wharf, as the ad for Brett Saloon tells us. As Eureka developed, the main concentration of the town's saloons moved inland, with the epicenter becoming located right here on the fabled 2nd Street, or 2 Street. Now, uh, the unidentified saloon photo we see here from the Historical Society collection is tentatively dated to 1867. I like the family-friendly atmosphere shown by the two kids at the bar, uh, presumably children of the saloon owner or perhaps a bartender. Of course, not all businesses that thrived in Eureka's Pleasure District were family-friendly. Yes, ma'am? Over here. There's a hat in front of us tonight. There are apparel these hats. Alrighty then, so uh, moving on to our next image, uh, not all businesses that uh, thrived in Eureka were that family-friendly. This sign from the old American Exchange Hotel building in an alley between C and D streets illustrates one of the biggest money-making industries of the lower part of town. A similar sign for rooms to let can still be seen today above a door on F Street on the building that now houses the cafe waterfront. 
the vast majority of the furnished rooms, rooms to let, and lodging houses in, in Old Eureka's Tenderloin were for very short-term lodgings, probably an hour or less. <laughs> now, this well-known photo shows the delightfully named Kitty Ferris's Joy Emporium, just up the street here on 2nd Street. The building still survives today, and appropriately, uh, it's now the home of good relations. <laughs> Unfortunately, the note on the photo doesn't say whether one of the women shown here is Kitty Ferris herself. Now, for this talk, I did some research into Kitty Ferris's life, although much of her story is still a mystery to me. Humboldt County marriage records show that 21-year-old Kitty Wilkinson married James or Jim Ferris in Eureka on July 17, 1883, which seems to have been shortly after Jim completed a term in San Quentin prison. In 1887, Jim and Kitty were convicted of operating a house of prostitution, but shortly afterward they obtained a license to operate a saloon, which horrified the writer of a letter to the editor in one of the local papers. Many other Eureka saloon owners and hotel keepers signed a petition in favor of the Ferris's being granted their saloon license. Jim Ferris may have died soon after this controversy, or else perhaps the marital bliss of Jim and Kitty ended in divorce, because county marriage records show Kitty Ferris marrying bartender Fremont Elihu Green in Eureka on December 5th, 1888. Now in our next picture, uh, we move one block up 2nd Street. I think the building at the left may be the same as the Joy Emporium building, just with a balcony that was not present in the previous photo. The buildings in the foreground are located in the block where Jim Dunn's and the Romano Gabriel Sculpture Garden display are now. According to a note accompanying this photo in the Historical Society collection, the modest little dark building at the far right was Aunt Sue's Sporting House. <laughs> Unfortunately, my research has not yet uncovered uh, the identity of Aunt Sue. <laughs> now, in our next two slides, uh, we see the dilapidated structure that was once Our Corner Saloon on First Street, shortly before the building was demolished. And uh, in the next picture, you can see, uh, yes, there it is, so you can see the mural uh, on the old co-op building at the right in that second picture. Now, in our next shot, we see our corner saloon in its heyday back in 1888. Intriguingly, as we learn from the note on the photo, this photograph belongs to millwright David Evans, inventor of the Evans' third saw that greatly streamlined and improved sawmill operations, and later mayor of Eureka. Future Mayor, mayor Evans seems to have definitely been a supporter of the saloon interests in Eureka politics. And as we see in the next picture, David Evans himself can be seen. He's third from right. He has the number six underneath him in this picture of James Holsworth's saloon on 2nd Street. Holsworth is the gent with the big dark beard uh, at the left with the number one beneath him. This building now holds the Pearl Lounge Bar next door to the Linen Closet Store. Saloon owner James Holsworth, it's worth mentioning, was one of the Eureka businessmen who signed the petition to grant Jim and Kitty Ferris their saloon license in 1887. Now, Old Town was always the focus of a tug of war between Eurekans who were making money hand over fist in the saloons and brothels, and those who wanted to regulate them, restrict them, or put them out of business. Eureka's Ordinance No. 54, passed in April 1884, made it unlawful for any female person between the hours of 8 o'clock p.m. Oops, we better get out of here, ladies. Um, 8 o'clock p.m. and 6 o'clock a.m. to be in any public drinking saloon, etc., where vinous, malt, or spiritous liquors are sold or given away. Many other similar laws followed over subsequent decades, and the humble newspapers are filled with reports of Eureka's soiled doves paying fines and saloon owners being busted for selling alcohol to women. Now, moving back to First Street for our next image, uh, we see a thriving Eureka business scene in 1888, with the Occidental Hotel on the right and the Revere House Hotel beyond it, and Harling's Cigar Factory across the street. When the photo is magnified, one can see from the sign up there that uh, the Occidental Hotel's restaurant and coffee stand boasted beer for five cents and meals for 25 cents, as well as the popular eggnog drink Tom and Jerry. Now, Tom and Jerry's were also available at the bar of the Cafe Royal, which was later the Oberon Saloon and is now the Oberon Restaurant. Beef tea was also available, according to the sign behind the bar. Personally, I think I'd go for the Tom and Jerry. <laughs> the room just visible at the right is thought to be the Cafe Royal Billiard Room. Now, in 1891, the Hotel Grand was built kitty corner across the street from where we are now, at the location where, in more recent years, Ann Mendenhall would put up her displays on Old Town and Eureka history every 4th of July. The Grand Hotel was the location of a tragic scandal in December of 1891, when Swiss immigrant Zacharias Kempf was riddled with bullets by Elk River Mill employee James Clay because Kempf had spent the night in a room at the Grand with Clay's wife. 
At his trial in February 1892, Clay was found not guilty of Kemp's murder, the jury agreeing with the editor of the Humboldt Standard that a, ma a man has the right to protect his family against the seducer, even to the taking of life. <laughs> now, as our photo here of the Scandala Scandinavian Saloon illustrates, even though it has some interesting spelling, the Scandinavian Saloon, uh, it shows that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Eureka boasted saloons that catered to various different immigrant communities. There were saloons and restaurants primarily frequented by members of the Scandinavian community, the Italian community, and the Greek community. And in 1915, the Humboldt Standard reported that Eureka might soon also have a Russian thirst parlor, as it said. Business at the Scandia Hotel Saloon was disrupted one night in 1899 when a horseman attempted to ride into the saloon. As the horse's head protruded through the doorway, the rider ordered beer for his horse and whiskey for himself. <laughs> the standard reported that neither was served and both horse and rider were removed by the police. <laughs> also dating from the year 1899 is our next image, this newspaper ad for the Alpine at 422nd Street. Next door to what is now Eureka Books, today there's a historical marker memorializing the Alpine as one of the longest operating brothels in Eureka. The Alpine was both a saloon and a brothel at various points in its history. This ad describes the Alpine as the most stylish place in town for a smile. Precisely how that smile would be induced is left to the imagination. <laughs> and speaking of Eureka Books, uh, we'll close the 19th century with an 1899 stereoscope slide that I bought at Eureka Books last week. Perhaps some of the more prosperous sporting women of Eureka's lower levels had bedrooms that looked like this. And who is to say whether pillow fights may have sometimes taken place, along with more scandalous ways of inducing smiles. I was surprised to see this gentleman uh, wearing long johns along with his nightshirt, but one imagines that the men of Eureka may have done so at times to keep out the cold on those foggy nights. Now with our next image, we're going to move into the 20th century, uh, with the shot of the Western Hotel at 1st and D Streets. The Western is going to figure prominently in our story later tonight. It was renamed the Monte Carlo Hotel in the 1920s, and was later owned by Muzzy herself. The train tracks are visible in the street in front of the hotel, reminding us that all of these old town places of business were just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the Eureka train depot, as well as from the waterfront. Now in our next image, uh, the prevalence of women of ill repute in old town's history led me to include this second photo of the Western Hotel. Naturally, I know nothing at all of the professions or the morals of the various women visible at the hotel's windows, but it did occur to me from looking at this that the corner tower window could have been an ideal location from which to size up prospective customers. <laughs> the corner of 1st and F Streets is shown in the early 20th century, decorated for a gathering of the native sons of the Golden West. We can just catch a glimpse of the old Fairwind restaurant and saloon at the left of the picture. The building at the right, now the Cafe Waterfront, is at this point the Eureka Beer Hall. The two girls in the foreground do not seem to be under the same restriction as were many Eureka children later in the 20th century, who were strictly forbidden to venture into the region of town north of 4th Street. Now here in all its glory is our current beautiful and historic location, the Eagle House Hotel. Early 20th century Eagle House bartender Bill Knoll is shown standing outside the saloon door. One of Knoll's predecessors in that job, William Mall, had a narrow escape from death here at the Eagle House in December of 1902. Maul was working both as bartender and as night desk clerk at the hotel front desk. At 11.30 one night, he went upstairs to room 17. Now, of course, if the room numbers haven't changed, I don't know if they have or not, but if they haven't, room 17 is kind of just up that way. He went up to room 17 to quiet down a patron who was making too much noise. The patron, coal oil Johnny Barber, shot several times through the door of number 17, one of the shots striking Maul in the throat. Doctors Lufbera and Hill operated that night and saved the wounded bartender's life, but his health was broken. In March 1903, the leading lights of Eureka's saloon industry held a benefit dance at the Armory Hall right across the street where Chapala's restaurant is now to help pay William Mall's continuing medical costs. Now, quite a long ways back in this talk, I mentioned Eureka City Council's Ordinance Number 54, which in 1884 tried to limit the hours in which women could be present in places which sold or gave away alcohol. This law must have been less than effective. In the early 1900s, a succession of ordinances sought to further limit the saloons. An ordinance of 1907 made it illegal for women to be inside places that sold alcohol at any hour of the day or night. Another ordinance, which came into effect on January 1st, 1910, made it illegal to sell alcohol after midnight. The city council was divided between members who tend to decide with the temperance, act temperance activists of the Good Government League and members who seem to have been clearly on the side of the saloon keepers. 
Mayor Lambert was pretty clearly on their side since he was discovered at the bar of a saloon at 12.50 a.m. on New Year's Day 1910 when the no alcohol after midnight ordinance came into effect. Also running afoul of that ordinance was Dick Tierney, owner of the Oberon Saloon, shown here. Dick lost his liquor license due to selling alcohol after midnight, but he found a clever way around that problem. For a nominal sum, he sold the saloon to his wife, Alice, who then applied to the city council for a liquor license. Naturally, the Good Government League protested. They pointed out that, as a woman, Alice could not legally be inside a place that sold alcohol. Therefore, they argued she could not be granted a liquor license because she would be unable to maintain control over activities in her own establishment. Alice was granted her license, however, probably largely due to this gentleman we will see in the next slide. He's got a nice beard standing in the foreground there. Um, he's shown with friends in front of the bar at the Snug Saloon on F Street. He is Eureka City Councilman Dan Halloran, who just happened to be Alice Tierney's uncle. <laughs> now, the Rainier Beer Girl in this 1902 ad for Eureka's Alhambra Saloon perhaps symbolizes the type of girl who many men hope to meet in Eureka's red light district. Prostitution was big business in Eureka, not just for the madams and other leaders of the industry, but also for the city itself. The Ferndale Enterprise reported in April 1903 that Eureka is short of funds, and as a result, another raid is to be made on the soiled doves of that city, who will be arrested and fined $25 or $30 apiece to replenish the treasury. <laughs> At various points in its history, Eureka instituted a licensing fee system for the town's brothels. The Humble Times of July 15, 1908 carried an article which painted the following vivid word picture. All yesterday afternoon, a continual stream of merry widow bonnets, silk parasols, and high-heeled slippers were to be seen entering the office of Police Judge Way, for yesterday was the time set for the landladies of the red-lighted houses of the demi-monde to appear and pay their annual tribute to the city coffers for the privilege of running their houses. The fine is paid every half year and has formerly been $35, but this year the assessment was raised to $50, which was the amount that the 25 landladies anteed yesterday, swelling the municipal coffers to the extent of $1,250, which will help some. It was generally thought that a kick would be registered by the fair ones at having to stand the increase of rates, but the announcement was made Monday, and each and every one of the women notified appeared, and with two great big double and one single eagle, which sum was placed in the city treasury. Now, as had been the case throughout Eureka's history, those who sought to profit from the world's oldest profession warred against those who sought to wipe it out. And as so often happens, when authorities attempted to placate reformers by cracking down on the red light district, they focused on an already marginalized group that had fewer resources with which to resist oppression. That is, in this case, the women of color who worked in Eureka's brothels. The Humboldt Times reported on April 19, 1912, that through the efforts of the police, a number of the female denizens of the red light district have been floated from town, and it is expected a number will depart on the next steamer sailing for the metropolis. It is said a ban is being placed on the colored women, their rents having been doubled recently by the owners of the houses. It is thought that in this way, most of them came to the city today and found work. Wages, $5, department store clerk. Wages, $5, to last seven days. Three for a miserable hall room she pays. Two nickels daily the streetcar receives. One dollar forty for eating, that leaves. One forty has such a long way to reach. Twenty fine banquets at seven cents each. There, every penny of wage has been spent, squandered for feasting and riding and rent. Spendthrift, she doesn't remember life's ills. Isabel ought to save up, reducing her bills. Oh, we've not mentioned her clothes. She must wear dresses, hats, shoes, stockings, ribbons for hair. How did she get them? Suppose that we stop. Perhaps it's as well that we let the thing drop. You good mathematicians may figure it out. It's a matter of figures, or figure, no doubt. Carry this picture, it's better, I'm sure. Character excellent, morals still pure. What else is written we won't try to see. The Elzebub thinks much the same way as we. Why, as I live, there's a tear in his eye. What else is written we won't try to pry. Surely the devil is feeling his age. Look what he's writing on Isabel's page. Virtue's a luxury hard to afford when a girl hasn't money enough for her board. Hmm. Now, as the 1910s went on, the men and women of Eureka's saloon scene found themselves at least temporarily on the losing side of history. The forces of prohibition were steadily gaining ground. In the election of 1912, much of Humboldt County was voted dry, prohibiting the sale of alcohol. As of July 23, 1912, the only places one could legally buy a drink in all of Humboldt were Eureka, Arcata, Ferndale, Blue Lake, and Trinidad. 
Even these bastions of wetness were forced dry on July 1st, 1919, when a nationwide wartime prohibition on the sale of alcohol went into effect. Although the law had been intended to save grain for food production during the war effort by ceasing the use of grain to make alcohol, the law was only ratified after the end of World War I. Mm -hmm. Finally, on January 16, 1920, the Nationwide Volstead Act went into effect, prohibiting the production, sale, or transportation of alcoholic beverages. Prohibiting actions is one thing, enforcing that prohibition is something else entirely. One response to prohibition is illustrated by the career of Peter Delaney, whose saloon in Eureka is shown here in the early 1900s. Delaney and Young was a major liquor manufacturing and distributing firm before Prohibition. When Prohibition came into effect, they became officially, at least uh, in our next slide, manufacturers of candy and soda water. Their factory is shown here, across the street from the Eagle House in the building where, among other businesses, Sailor's Grave Tattoo is now located. Delaney and Young did produce candy and soda water, but one does wonder what other refreshing beverages they might still have been distributing. It is striking to note how many Eureka business owners who ran saloons in the pre-Prohibition days are listed as the proprietors of soft drink establishments and Prohibition era business directories. From the number of raids on speakeasies, also known as blind pigs, and bootlegging joints reported in the Eureka newspapers of the era, it's easy to see that most of the drinks these establishments sold were far from soft. Now up the street from the Eagle House is 209 Second Street, constructed in 1932 as a purpose-built speakeasy and house of prostitution. Glenn Nash was a young carpenter involved in its construction, recalling 60 years later that the building was designed for a card room and blind pig operation, complete with hidden trap doors and sliding panels for hiding booze. The second floor was designed for a brothel, with several small bedrooms and, of course, a wired step in the hallway. I remember a very pretty blonde lady coming by every few days in order that she might see how her new house of pleasure was coming along. She went by the name Sugar. It was said she got married and left the profession, but the building is still there, and of course it still is today. Now, 209 Second Street endured, but nationwide prohibition did not. In 1933, the year after Sugar's House of Pleasure was built, the majority of voters in 36 states voted to repeal prohibition. The manufacture, sale, and transport of alcohol was once again legal, and in the words of the song, happy days were here again, except that by this time, Eureka and the rest of the country were in the throes of the Great Depression. Shown here is the interior of a Eureka bar and lunch counter, possibly Jim Dunn's, in May of 1937, as you can see from uh, in blowing up the picture and looking at the calendar page there. Now this was the Eureka to which 37-year-old Margaret Muzzy Abbott came in the next year and in which she found a new husband, a new career as owner-operator of the Monte Carlo Hotel, and fame as the Sophie Tucker of Humboldt. We will hear much more about Muzzy and about more recent wild times in Old Town from our next speakers. And thank you. My name is Evo Finerke, and I've lived in Eureka all my life. I was born here in 1920, and this is my wife, Catherine. I was told I could talk a little bit about my family and the history and how they got here, when they got here, and why they ended up in Eureka. Well, my father, at the time, in about 1900, he came over with his father to, uh, to the United States because there was so much poverty in his town during that time. That was about the 1900s. He did come over here for a reason to make some money so that they could go back and take care of their family. They stayed here about two years. My father did, at that time, uh, learned to speak English and uh, in about two years they made enough money on the East Coast they worked on the East Coast and they uh, went back to Italy and my father had to serve some time in the army so uh, he was accepted in the Swiss Guard and he spent two years in the Swiss Guard then he got out of that and came back to the United States worked his way across the United States to San Francisco because he had some friends there. So he didn't like the work that it was doing in San Francisco, so somebody said they had a lot of work in Humboldt County and uh, he wanted to be a logger, so he came up here. And that was about 1900, and just before the big earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. So he took a ship 
came to Eureka, got himself a job in uh, the Bell Factory, and the Bell Factory had a, a camp in uh, Essex, California, which is now Fieldbrook area. And he worked there for quite a while. And about that time, my mother decided she wanted to come to the United States also. And she told her mother she wanted to come over here because there was very few eligible people that were in Italy at the time. So she came over here and she was sponsored by uh, the Trentoli family in Eureka, which meant she had to spend some time with them before she could do anything else. So she came clear across country by herself, didn't speak a word of English, and uh, she came over to San Francisco and found out that my father, her husband, uh, wasn't at the time, but she found out he lived in this area and she and he knew each other in the little town in Italy where they'd come from, so she wanted to meet him up in here. So she got on a ship in San Francisco and came to the foot of C Street here, and the first nights she spent, she spent in this place where was the Bungusa Hotel at the time. And when, and when my when my dad found out that she was in town, why well, he came to Eureka, met her, and then they got together and got married. And uh, but he lived they, he lived in a camp Essex at the time, and uh, so they moved to Camp Essex. And my that was about 19. 13, maybe 1914. My brother was born in Camp Essex at night in 1914. And uh, he was, well, they lived there until, well, until after, well, during the prohibition area, when my dad decided he was going to be well, in business for himself. So he moved the family to Arcata and he came to Eureka, and uh, he and his brother-in-law were partners in a business here, which was was bootlegger, of course. <laughs> and he was, and but he. I did the wrong thing. <laughs> well, I was going to say that uh, he moved his family to Arcata, but he, he had his business in Eureka, and the reason he didn't want his family over here because they were, at that time, it was not a very, very good business to be in, but uh, about, uh, I guess in the 19... 19 why he did move his family into Eureka and I was born in 1920 and uh, he uh, moved us he moved us into a building uh, where Roy's Club is today that's where I've lived since 1924 on and off uh, I still live there we still have the apartment that I lived in when I was four years old because they moved us into this area. Yeah. And I was going to say that I lived on 2nd Street all my life, and uh, I have some stories I could tell about 2nd Street, but uh, this, was, this, was, this was during the Prohibition area when uh, it was, wasn't really the safest place to be, but the, we had many families with children uh, that lived in the area, and Olga Dahl over here is one of them. She was, she was, she lived in the area at the same time, and uh, we all went to school together. We went, it was about 
oh, it was about 10 or 15 families in the area here. It was the Peronis, the uh, Matucci's, there was the uh, Frizons, and there was just a lot of family kids in the area, and we all played on 2nd Street. Uh, mostly uh, during the, well, during the school years, uh, we all we all did about the same thing, but I was going to say too that uh, uh, I was going to say a little bit about Muzzy. Uh, we used to have, I mean, I run a, a bar on uh, D Street. Muzzy was about a block down from the, or a block up from. I was, I mean, a block down from me. And on a clear night, uh, we used to open the front door and listen to Muzzy instead of my juice box. <laughs> but then there was other things I was going to say about we was, when we when my dad moved the family to Eureka here. Uh, there was a lot of other things that happened that uh, like there was quite a bit of violence. Uh, in my dad's saloon at the time, uh, his partner shot a man, and uh, they tried to blame my father for it, but my father just got, well, he proved that he was in the Liberty Theater at the time, so he didn't uh, have any problems. But then there was another man, well, there, there was a place called the Shanty, right across the alley from my place. And uh, at that particular time, there was a man shot, it was the Iceman, he was shot right out in the alley, but they don't know if that was an accident or somebody tried to do it on purpose. But I was gonna say because of the shanty, there was a time when uh, they, had a, they had a, behind the shanty was a nice, uh, open lot, and my sister and I used to play in it quite often. And one one time, the gates were locked, and we wanted we were very curious, so we decided we wanted to go in and find out what was going on. So we got into the gate, and went in there, and there was about three or four, maybe five people playing baseball out there. Or we decided we would get in and help them, so we got in and played baseball with them. And uh, in later years, uh, when we were, when I was in business, this friend of mine, man of Verani, and a man by the name of Donald Kane, which is very was a very popular name at the time, said, "You know who you were playing ball with in that what do you call it?" I said, "No, because we was only 12 years old." He said it was Machine Gun Kelly, a uh, man by the name of. Uh, uh, Babyface Nelson. I said, are you kidding? He says, no. He says, because that was the stopping, it was a stopping place for the, for the gangs when it was, uh, when the area was hot in the Midwest, Midwest, they used to travel along the West Coast and the shanty was one of the places they stopped. And they were there for about a week and we were in there just about every day playing ball with them. That was so, yeah. And then I was gonna say that, she's, I was gonna tell you that about the brothels in Eureka during the time I was growing up, and a lot of people know, why do you know so much about them? Well, I said, well, when I was, when I was 14 or 15 years old, I used to sell the Times paper and it came out around 11 or 12 o'clock at midnight. And uh, I used to have four or five customers uh, and in the brothels. There was the uh, Ruby Rooms, there was the Denver Rooms, there was the Mission Rooms, and I had those, I had those as my, uh, they were my uh, customers. And I used to go up there and sell papers. And uh, I, sell paper, I sold papers all over the town. And at that time, uh, there was 
just a few places that were open during the night, but we were, as kids, we'd go into these, uh, into the bars that would let us in there and sell papers, and when we sold all our papers, we could go home. But, oh yeah, well, I'll tell you, there used to be a, a step. There were some of them that had, uh, were on the second floor, and they had a step that rang a bell. And when I got onto that step, the lady would come to the door, whoever it was, one of the girls or one of the, or the madam, and I was always hoping it was one of the girls that had a good night because I would give her a paper and she'd give me 25 cents. <laughs> but uh, when the madam come, I used to get a dime. <laughs> but that was about all I can tell you. So. Bill Williams is going to speak to you for a, a few minutes here as well. Bill, you ready? Thank you. Can you hear me again? Yeah. Well, I can't top that story of evils because uh, my dad didn't arrive here until uh, it was 1920. And uh, he immigrated because it was after the first, second world, first world war and there was no job in Europe, you know, and everything was down. So he immigrated here and he was a watchmaker trained in Switzerland. And so he worked for a jeweler in town for about six years. He started in 1927. People probably know where, right on 2nd Street. And uh, did fairly decently in 27. 29, the crash came, made things a little rough. My mother came to town, she was a registered nurse, she was also Swiss, and she heard there was a Swiss watchmaker down here on 2nd Street. So she got together with my dad and she got more than she bargained for. But she wouldn't marry him until he moved off of 2nd Street. a little slower too because you can probably hear me. <laughs> anyway, uh, they did get married, of course, and I came along at about 35, and uh, he was starved to death like everybody during the Depression. And uh, But he had enough moxie to keep it going, and in 39 he had a little premonition about the Second World War. He moved to the corner where the Ritz is now, and uh, had a hell of a business. It was incredible, and we still do. But uh, Donald Kane's brother walked by one day and dad had all these windows. And he said, Jesus, Billy, you got all these windows. You ought to call yourself Ten Window Williams. Aww. So he did. And the things just, just kept going. And pretty soon it got so much better, he, for a year he was 15 windows. <laughs> and then somebody bought the building and he had to move. So he moved over to where we are now and bought the building for $26,000 and put 75000 into it, and, uh, re and since then there's been other things done to it. But anyway, he did, had deserves a lot more foresight than I have, ever, will ever have. But he did a heck of a job. And I have some things here about Muzzy, a few stories that are kind of interesting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna look at my papers here. But uh, one of them is the police cars, Muzzy's bar, the glow room, was adjacent to the Nally. And she'd open the window, and that's why Evo could hear all the music. Uh, it was good to the people, but she was tough. And she was, she was a kind-hearted lady. She did a lot for the area, a lot of uh, benefits, as you know, nurse. And uh, just, uh, just, just everybody loved her. Wore a lot of wigs, and uh, just a, just a fun-loving, real fun-loving person. And there's another story that Floyd Batiga told me uh, yesterday about... Um, there was some students at Humboldt State, some ladies in the dorm. He was going to Humboldt then. And they were, the women's club in Humboldt County were uh, going to put together a tea for the mothers and the new students coming to Humboldt State. Well, some of the new students didn't have their mothers here. So they coerced Muzzy to go to that tea with them. And of course, she wore all her big gowns and big 
bus and the flowers and all this stuff. And, it, and she did that for a few years and it was just a kick in the pants. Everybody just got a kick out of her. And I, I saw Sophie Tucker myself maybe 50, 60 years ago. And she was kind of a Sophie Tucker type person. And uh, as I say, Joey Paul had the print shop next to us, so I'd see her quite often. And, uh, and I, I was in there a few times a little young to get the full brunt of the thing. But it was, was a lot of fun and she was just a wonderful person. Thank you. Thanks you guys for sharing the stories about your family and in your life. We have one more speaker tonight. Larry Lazio is over here. And he's going to talk a little bit about his family, I think, and maybe the fishing industry. And whatever he wants. <laughs> and a little surprise. Anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, here tonight and to hear the history that uh, I didn't know a lot about. But I want to go back 132 years in 1884 when my grandfather Lorenzo sailed up from San Francisco to, uh, I think, Eureka, or maybe uh, the Salt River on the Eel River because he came here in August of that year uh, to catch the salmon and salt them in barrels. What they used to do is they used to cut the salmon in two and put them in barrels of 800 pounds of salted salmon and this is the way they preserved the, the product in those days and then shipped it down to San Francisco. From San Francisco what was used there stayed there and the, the balance went to New York City for uh, the production of the locks for the Jewish people in uh, in uh, New York City. So it was um, about the early 20s when my father Tom Lazio came here for the old San Francisco International Fish Company and in those days he stayed across the street at the Italian Swiss Hotel. Um, if there's anyone in the audience that knows the name of the family that ran it back in uh, Evo, do you remember the name? The family that ran the Italian Swiss in the old days? Massey yes. family. Okay, and then they, they eventually came over here and ran this one, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I think the interesting thing of the fishing industry and the two street area, there was money being made in the fishing industry. Uh, in the late 30s, for the first time ever, crabs were able to be exported out of Humboldt County. Up until that time, it was illegal to ship crabs from Humboldt County anywhere else. They had to be consumed here. So that started my father's business in April of April 1st of 1940. He started the, the company with 1,200 bucks of borrowed money. And at that period of time, and Evo knows this very well, there was a gray gold rush, and the gray gold rush was the shark livers, soup fin shark livers got up to $23 a pound, and boats were making in three days in 1940, I still have one of the checks, $35,000. When a new car was what, maybe $400, $500? In those days, it was a gray gold rush, and there were boats from all over the West Coast that came here. My father went down to Pittsburgh, California, and bought every single gill net that he could find and brought them up here for the fishing of the soup fin sharks offshore. And there were a lot of Scandinavians and uh, Finnish people that came from Seattle. And this was one of the prime areas of the fishing in no November, December, January, when the soup fin sharks appeared in the, the waters offshore. Um, I remember, I remember. Um, I did, I don't want to flap back to the muzzy thing, I, I did, uh, as a maybe 20 year old, 19, 20 year old, go to the glow room after we came out of uh, Tony Lenzi's place in the old days. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is how many people were involved with the fishing industry and how many young people, maybe some of you in this room, fished off that dock just a block away 
with the old bamboo poles and catching and catching perch and the stuff. So that was just a little bit of the other color of this wonderful evening that I think has just been terrific. Um, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions uh, if anyone has any any or. I have a question. Can you tell us a story about? Oh, okay, I missed that. Um, when they ship these shark livers out of here, uh, there might be a hundred thousand dollars of of product on board that truck. So they actually had a uh, passenger in the passenger seat with a shotgun on his lap, and one of them was Evo. <laughs> So just, uh, that's, Bill? Boy, I don't think you told them what they did with the shark livers. Okay, the shark livers were used by the um, pharmaceutical industry for the production of vitamin A and vitamin D, and for the inclusion in the then developing high altitude bombers. The oil was so pure that it was a needed ingredient for one of the instruments on the aircraft that we had developed at the start of World War II. So that's just a little sideline. The other thing I do want to bring up about my dad, my dad in 1950 uh, knew that there were these little pink shrimp in certain areas where the drag boats would go. Now for those of you that don't know what a drag boat is, a drag boat is a boat that drug uh, two uh, doors that we're at an angle with a net on the bottom of the ocean. And in certain areas off the Klamath River, they would get these little pink shrimp in the corners of this big mesh net. So it was kind of a, a favorite thing that the boat would shake some of these and bring in a bucket or two, and they would cook them in the back room and peel the shrimp and eat them, and they were really good. So from that, my father deduced, well, Maybe he was down in Louisiana, he saw a shrimp net with a little tiny mesh to it. He decided to buy one, he had it shipped out. The boat General Pershing was the first uh, shrimp boat on the west coast of the United States and uh, proved that there was a sufficient quantity out there and today that shrimp industry on California, Oregon and Washington is probably in the 50 to 60 million dollar class uh, of value, and then that was started by, on the West Coast by my father back then. Wow. So, those of you might remember Lazio Seafood Restaurant, Foot of Sea Street, probably the most, probably the most unique restaurant that'll ever exist on the West Coast. And the reason that was so unique was that that was the production and processing plant for all the buying stations that he had back then along the coast. So every night, there were trucks coming into Eureka, there were boats coming into Eureka. There was 100 to 150,000 pounds of fish on a good day in the plant. Wow. So that little restaurant, which was started because of the shark uh, days, um, had the pick of the crop. I mean, if, if there was 10,000 pounds of petrole that came in that day and the restaurant needed 50 pounds or 70 pounds or 100 pounds, it went to the restaurant. All the prime stuff went to that restaurant. That, that type of, of, of situation just does not exist on the west coast uh, of the United States anymore. So, um, short and sweet, the last time I gave a talk for the Historical Society, I happen to have two copies of the last menu of Lazio's restaurant. Aww. And I'd like to, on behalf of the Historical Society, I'd like to auction them here tonight. <laughs> and the funds go directly to the Historical Society for the roof, I hope, or any other needs that they have. So um, I'll wind up my little talk and entertain a bid uh, for a historic menu of the Lazio restaurant. $100. $100 in the back. $200. $300. $300. Oh my goodness. Raise your hand, please. 
It's at 300. Is that in the back? Where's the 300 at? Carol. Oh, Carol, up on up on top. Thank you, Carol.